Hey guys, welcome back to Home Built, and with any luck, we are actually going to be able to start the Alferrari this week. Fingers crossed. Alright guys, welcome back to Home Built and if you were watching last week, you would have seen that I started cranking over the Alferrari. I've got oil, I've got spark, I have um, injectors working, I've got a bunch of the bits and pieces working. There's still a few little electrical gremlins that I've got to sort out to actually get the Alferrari started. But we've got, things are looking good so far. We definitely uh, have oil pressure, uh, we have the starter motor engaging, so there's a lot of the things that I was concerned about that I have actually um, have got sorted. But there was a few bits and pieces that I need to tackle to get it running that still aren't working. If you missed it, I'll put a link up above so you can catch up um, to where we are. And uh, as always, think about subscribing and all that sort of stuff, it does help out the channel. Uh, let's get stuck in and I'll show you the first thing that I need to tackle to uh, get the car started. All right, so I've been in here, I've been rewiring uh, the whole back end of the car, and um, I have now rewired my relay so that it should be negatively switched, not positively switched. But I also went under the car, and if you can see inside, I'm, I, uh, I played around with the valves, so you can see there's a valve there, you can sort of see the end of it, making sure the exhaust is open, so when I uh, start the car, the uh, exhaust will be open, not closed. So, let's move on to what I messed up on the ignition switch. Now, it wasn't working last week, and uh, I've worked out why the car would not start on the key, and it's a very simple one. Basically, uh, the PDM that I have in this car, it's a little tiny motorbike PDM unit that I used, um, that actually needs to be negatively switched. So I converted this and set this up to negatively switch that on. But what I didn't switch on was uh, the, the wire going straight to the starter motor. The starter motor is, it needs to be positively switched. Ah, just little bits and pieces is what it takes. Every single thing needs just the next little thing to uh, get it all working the way it should. That was reasonably straightforward. And now we turn this on. You can see that uh, my gauges turn on and then if I go through and, and it cranks. So key is fixed. All right, well, this is how it goes. I've been tearing into my wiring even more. I have spent all day so far uh, trying to get the fuel pumps to work. It should be a relatively simple circuit. I've sent a diagram through to Adam at Link. He's been extremely patient with me and uh, uh, trying to work through my issues. I'm going to, I think, have a break for a second and do something a little bit different to uh, sort of get my mind off of it. And let's see if we can find top dead center on this engine and mark it on the crank pulley so we know what we're dealing with. So we have the pulley here underneath the car, but there is no markings on it. You can actually see here, this is the cutout that we're looking for. So this is 60 teeth on this wheel that I added, minus two. And you can actually see my reluctor here, that's the sensor there. So I need to be able to tell the ECU when the engine is at top dead center, how many degrees that sensor is from that cutout. So, uh, that is now what I've got to try and work out. All 
All right, so using my dial indicator on cylinder number one and a screwdriver sitting on top of the piston, as I crank the engine over, it lifts the screwdriver up and down. And uh, when it gets to the very top, that's top dead center. But it's very hard to measure the very top. So the best way to do it is actually this way. So if you imagine um, this basic diagram, as you're cranking around, the piston goes up, and then it sort of level flattens out at the top and it's hard to get that exact spot. So what I find is as you come up, if you measure a spot just before dot dead center and then and, and work out whatever that reading is on your dial indicator and then wherever it hits it again on the way back down and split the difference and that's exactly top dead center. So that's what I've done there. So hopefully that makes sense to some of you. But uh, we have now top dead center and uh, it's very hard to see down here. I put a mark on the... Uh, trigger wheel. I also went under and I counted the teeth between where the reluctor is and the gap in the, um, the, the trigger wheel. And it's a 60 minus two trigger wheel. So there's two teeth missing. And there are 21 teeth between where the reluctor is and where the gap starts. I know there's 60 teeth, it's 360 degrees. So there are six degrees per tooth. 21 times six is uh, 126, so it's 126 degrees is the offset of the um, uh, the reluctor on the wheel. So I know I can put that into the ECU and find top dead center for the ECU. Hopefully that makes sense. All right, so uh, the timing's done. I had my break from the fuel pump and I sent a little diagram through to Adam at Link. And... Um, Thankfully, he discovered my problem. I've rewired it, and now, if you listen, fuel pump on, fuel pump off. It's working the way it's supposed to. This might get a little bit nerdy, but uh, this is the uh, little video diagram. I'll voice over it instead of Adam that, to sort of explain the issue that I was going through. Now, I understand this is going to be a bit nerdy and um, really not necessary for a lot of you, but I'd like to explain because it's an interesting anomaly that uh, I learnt during this process. Now, Adam has redrawn the way I have wired up my car and uh, going through it here, basically the first thing you need to know is that a, when you cut power to a relay, it doesn't collapse straight away. It takes a, uh, a short time for the energy to dissipate, the uh, magnetic field to release and then it will open the contact of the relay so it's not instantaneous what is happening is when i cut off my ignition this relay would shut down the magnetic field and finally collapse and open that uh, relay so it was no longer sending power through to the ecu but what was happening is that this relay is still only just been shut off so it still has a bit of charge it's still connecting and still closing that relay so I'm, what was happening is i was still getting voltage straight from the battery coming down going through this closed relay because it still hasn't collapsed yet going through the fuel pump relay continuing along entering into the ecu back feeding through the ECU, back out, and it can't go up because the main relay is closed and there's nowhere for it to go, but it can still go down and it's going through to the relay again, and now it's locked into a loop because it's done it quick enough that it hasn't had time to collapse, and there is permanent 12 volts running through that entire system, and that relay will never close. So Adam's suggestion, and this is actually what I did, and it worked, was in, to remove that connection from, from my main ignition relay and connect the secondary relay directly to the ignition switch. And in that case, the relays should collapse at the same time. And even if they didn't, there is no connection anymore between the ECU main feed and uh, the fuel pump main feed. So there's no way that it can con contact the loop. And uh, that was my issue. All right, now we have a working fuel pump. At this stage, there's only two more things to uh, correct to be able to start the car. And they are to calibrate 
uh, the throttle bodies and calibrate the pedal. Now, um, I've already gone through it and the, uh, the, the main throttle body calibrates fine. I'm having an issue calibrating this throttle body. Now, um, because it has two throttle bodies, I actually run a, uh, a link, uh, it's an e-throttle module, so it's a separate module, uh, which I only just wired in the other day. So I need to double check that I've done that correctly. And, because uh, obviously it's not working, so it's probably something that I messed up. More than likely something I messed up. Uh, and, uh, and if we can get this calibrated and working, uh, the pedal hopefully should be relatively smooth sailing and then we can try and start it. So let's uh, dig into this. All right, so um, yeah, another half a day so far of tearing my hair out. Um, I've managed to calibrate throttle one, still cannot get throttle two to work. I actually swapped the uh, cables around so I know the throttle itself is working fine. So I've also gone through and done the pedal sensor and made sure that's correct. So one last thing I thought I might do beforehand is, um, is check my fuel pressure because the fuel pump is working but I don't actually know how much pressure it is holding. So uh, let's go and have a look at that. All right, so uh, another mess up from me that I've just worked out. I had the fuel pressure regulator around the wrong way. So that means it was flowing nothing. So um, unfortunately, because of the way I have this all plumbed in, there's no easy way to flip it around the other way. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna have to uh, re-plumb in the return line somehow. And um, yeah, I I'll uh, need to pull this exhaust out now and put a, uh, a bigger hole going through this uh, little brace plate so I can sort of mount it into position and hopefully we can uh, put it back in again and get it running the way it's supposed to. By the way, I am well aware that that is a very crooked exhaust and it irritates me even more than it does you guys and it will be fixed very soon. But at this stage, I've got high priorities. That's actually a cleaner solution because um, I may even actually move the wiring here through the bulkhead over here because the muffler sits in this location here. It's going to be easier to build a, um, a heat shield that uh, protects all this stuff and uh, just covers up all of this in the middle. So the uh, return line now goes on the other side around and then up back into the tank. All right, that's better. Now I have uh, 60 PSI fuel pressure. That's what I run in the 911, so that's just what I'm gonna run here. Uh, so of course I have a fuel leak with some fittings here that are down behind the engine. It is a really difficult place to get to. Uh, that is gonna be an absolute pain to try and tighten up while the engine's in here. <sighs> so frustrating. All right, well, that was a bit of a mission because as I showed you, it's a very tight spot down here behind the engine to tighten up that fitting. Turns out I hadn't tightened it much at all. Like it was basically just finger tight. So that's why it's leaking. Um, it ended up, I had to, I used uh, an AN spanner and I had to actually make a spanner for the top. I took this old spanner and grind, ground it out so that it would be the right size to uh, be able to get in there because there was just, there's just no other space. So uh, got that done, tested it, no leaks, which is, uh, which is a good thing because uh, that could potentially be quite a hazard if it was leaking. Uh, so we actually have fuel running the correct direction now. Um, it actually pressurized the fuel rail. We have fuel pressure. Um, we have no leaks. And uh, I actually messed up my throttle wiring completely, which does not surprise me at all. 
Adam found out that, uh, yeah, I completely balls it up. But um, yeah, we'll uh, rewire that now. And then fingers crossed, we can have a throttle and that's the last thing we're waiting for. I have rewired that throttle. Let's see if it finally, finally is doing what it should be doing. It says it worked. Hey! I am actually shaking right now because I have one last thing to do, which is just change um, a setting in here for the crank trigger, and then I think we can actually try and start it. I'm petrified. <laughs> All right, guys, this is it. <laughs> Let's see if it does anything. All right. Okay. Alright, so let me run you through the issues that we've been having. So, so when you saw me crank it early, we weren't getting any crank signal. So um, we double checked the wiring. For some reason, the, uh, the document wiring we have was around the wrong way. I switched the polarity and got the crank signal wiring. The next issue we've had is I can't for the life of me get the cam signals to work. So um, these are the factory Ferrari sensors. We, I had them wired correctly as per Ferrari, but we went through and checked that. And we've since tried a multitude of different uh, wiring configurations, basically every single uh, possible wiring configuration from the three pin plug. And um, it's still not giving us a signal. And I've tried both. Well, I have two of these because this uh, ran as two four cylinders. It had sort of two of everything. So it had, um, two cam angle sensors and it had originally, uh, I believe, two crank angle sensors on either side of the flywheel. And um, yeah, it's not giving us a reading, which is quite annoying. What I am beginning to think is I might actually try um, getting rid of these sensors and getting something off the shelf um, that I can machine up and make a, uh, a fitting for so it can fit into the Ferrari um, heads read off the ferrari cam as per this but just get a sense that we know that we can get to work because no matter how i do this i can't seem to find the signal and it shouldn't be that hard i don't know why it's not working whether the both sensors are dead which is odd but um yeah neither of them will work so so let me clarify what the cam angle sensor does. So obviously I have a crank angle sensor which measures the location of the crank in a 360 degree rotation. The issue is, is that the crank has to do two full revolutions, 720 degrees, per combustion cycle. So if you only want to fire the spark plug on the compression stroke and not on the exhaust stroke, you need to know which of the two revolutions the crank is currently on. And that is where the cam comes in because the cam spins at exactly half the speed of the crank. So that can tell the ECU which cycle you're on. So uh, apparently, according to Adam, it will still potentially run like this 50% of the time. So half the time it's going to be firing on the wrong cycle and the other half of the time I might be able to crank it and uh, get it going. What that sounds like to me is I can potentially still get it to run. So I'm going to put these back in so I don't get oil spraying everywhere. Um, and we're going to try and crank the engine over and uh, just keep cranking it and see if we can get it to actually fire. All right, we're going to try it again. Let's just see. Oh, that was making coughs. Just make sure there's nothing around, everything's working, not leaking. No leaks, no leaks. Try again. 
time coming and it's not finished it's a long way from finished it's not driving there's still a lot of things to get done but yes ha ha yes <laughs> Woohoo! Ha! 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 <sighs> that's such a relief that is such a relief it's loud that's with the exhaust valves open. I haven't tried closing them. I like, like, it's not a wide app yet. There's, there's lots to do. Yes. Whoo. Ah, yeah. All right. I want to try it again and just get a log this time. Once more, I've closed the exhaust valves this time, so let's just try it again with closed exhaust valves. Well, that's much more sense. Much quieter. Well, that was a massive week of headaches. This has been four whole days on just some of these little wiring gremlins. Only, only four or five things I had to get right. And it's still not perfect. We still don't have cam angle sensors. Um, we, uh, yeah, there's, there's still lots of things to do, but it starts and it runs. That is, that is just a huge, huge win. Um, lots, lots more to do, but the basics are there and, uh, my dodgy wiring actually seems to actually work. <laughs> so, ah, oh, there's a huge thank you to Adam at Link. He's been, uh, backwards and forwards, uh, on the phone to me. He doesn't normally help out on this sort of stuff, but, uh, he's, uh, he is brilliant and really helped me out on this. And, uh, we have a running car. So, uh, I am definitely, uh, done for the week. I am, yeah, like I'm fried. So I think that means it's time for Fun Facts with Mrs. Jeff. Hey guys, 2009 marked the end of the Ferrari F430 with its replacement, the 458. 
This is a ground up redesign with the exterior styling by Pen Farina with an emphasis on aerodynamics. It featured deformable winglets in the front grille that lower at high speeds with the car reaching downforce of 140 kilos at 200k an hour. Now interior was designed by French designer with input from Michael Schumacher. A lot of the layout is inspired by race cars with things like the indicators and high beams being on the steering wheel instead of on stalks. The engine is an evolution of the Ferrari Maserati F136 family. The 4.5 litre V8 engine makes 540 horsepower at 9,000 revs per minute, pushing the car from 0 to 100k an hour in 3.4 seconds. The 458 was also the first Ferrari to not be offered with a manual transmission, instead using a 7-speed dual clutch, which was shared with the SLS AMG. It runs! <laughs> it actually runs! Oh, it was a uh, it was a big week. It was a mm. lot of work, uh, but we're there. It runs, and um, yeah, next week is going to be the last week I actually get to put out a video on the Alpha before I head to Ren Sport Reunion. So if any of you guys are going there uh, to uh, Ren Sport Reunion in the US. Um, Come and say hi, we'll be over there. And then we'll be doing a, uh, a bit of a road trip, doing some meetups over on the east coast of, L of uh, the US. So uh, keep uh, in contact on Instagram and Facebook for that because we'll, uh, we'll give you the heads up on there where we're going to be if you want to come and say hi. Very exciting. Yes. Sorry for the slurry, still getting used to speaking. <laughs> Jeff's enjoying the quiet time at home. It's good. <laughs> <laughs> like, subscribe, let Jim know what you think. He's really like to catch up with you. Um, and yeah, uh, yep. Patreon of course, and I think that's everything. Yep, and we'll uh, see you on the next one. See okay. you guys. Instead using a seven speed dual clutch, which was shared with the AMS. <laughs> the 4.5 litre V8 makes 4,000 horsepower at 9,000 revs a minute, pushing. It does not make 4,000 horsepower. <laughs> I don't know, I knew it was That's a lot of <laughs> horsepower. Wow. <laughs> Give me one of those engines. <laughs> 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 <laughs>